Epilepsy is a brain disorder where abnormal electrical activity causes persistent seizures, affecting one in 100 people worldwide. Epilepsy is the second most common neurological disease after stroke. In the past, treatment options were limited, but now two important advances in both detecting epileptic seizures and their surgical treatment offer sufferers new hope. Oliver and Joey are identical twins. They share the same DNA, but there's one key difference. Oliver has chronic epilepsy. We were a little bit worried about Ollie when he was born, but it was only when he was five hours old that we realised that he was in trouble. He'd had a stroke around about the time that he was born, and we were told that he would have cerebral palsy affecting his right-hand side and that he was at a higher risk of developing epilepsy. And that's what happened when Oliver was just three years old. The stroke that hit Oliver at birth caused a cavity to form in the left hemisphere of his brain. The scar tissue surrounding this cavity caused his nerve cells to fire electrical signals erratically, generating a lightning storm inside his brain. I think most people think of epilepsy as the grand mal seizures where people are sort of fall on the floor and, and twitching. It's not like, it hasn't been like that. Hi Ollie, are you going to bang the table? Before epilepsy started, he was an amazing concentrator for his age. And he basically started rolling all over the ground, slamming into the furniture on purpose. <laughs> so we really struggled with the fact that our kid, who was on the most fantastic trajectory, suddenly wasn't socially appropriate, wasn't concentrating, wasn't learning. Without treatment, Oliver's epilepsy will get worse. At the age of five, he already wears a helmet to protect him from seizures that cause him to lose consciousness and fall to the ground. But even worse than that are the learning problems he will face. We've been told that he'll probably end up at a special school unable to learn because the epilepsy has such a disorganising impact on his brain. And this is a bright little boy. At the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne, there's a new method for studying the brains of children. And it gives epilepsy sufferers like Oliver a much better chance at a life free of seizures. Oliver's stroke caused significant scarring in the brain and that then is generating seizures in Oliver's brain. It has really severe implications for his brain for two reasons. One is that with the seizures that he's having, um, it means that he has abnormal firing in the brain. But similarly, just to the medications alone that we need to give Oliver to try and control the seizures, in fact, have a negative effect on his development. Oliver's story is a common one. Around one third of all epilepsy sufferers gain little or no relief from modern medications, many of which have serious side effects. So what's the long-term solution for him? The long-term solution is surgery. Somebody like Oliver in the past would do what we call hemispherectomy, which is where you either remove or disconnect the whole of his left side of his brain. While this technique does stop epileptic seizures, it also destroys a lot of brain function. So where technology has changed in the last five years or so has been the development of what we call tractography. White matter tractography is like a, a road map to the brain. We look at the highways, we look at the narrow streets, we get a sense of how the brain parts are connected to each other and how they're changing with time. These highways and narrow streets are commonly known as the brain's white matter tracks, tightly packed bundles of nerve fibres that connect and communicate between parts of the brain. With a standard MRI scan, they're impossible to see, but there is a way. What we measure is we measure the flow of water through the brain. Water molecules are constantly moving in the brain. They never stop. It's called diffusion. 
In most parts of the brain, including the grey matter, the movement of the water is random. But inside the white matter tracks, the water moves directionally. Using an MRI scan, the direction of the water flow can be calculated and the brain's true complexity revealed. Dr. Joseph Yang was the lead researcher in developing the tractography techniques used here and also personally responsible for plotting the tractography for Oliver's brain. So what's this a picture of? So Mark, this is a picture of Oliver's brain. Uh, we're looking from feet up. That's the left side of his brain, that's the right side. And to show that these are actually the area that we're going to target for surgery tomorrow. That's what involved. you have to remove? Exactly. Okay, but how do you know if they're getting too close to the white matter, the white tracks of the brain. Before we're able to do tractography, there is absolutely no way you can tell exactly where the nerve fiber tracks are. Until now? Until now. So with a click of a button. That's a whole new level of detail now. Exactly. We can change the angle a bit. Now we're looking at... In Oliver's case, the, the sensitive nerve tracks that control both the movement of the right side of his body and his vision run right through the area of brain tissue that needs to be removed. Before tractography, this kind of surgery would have been extremely risky. It's the day of the surgery and Oliver and his family are making their way to the operating theatre. It's going to be a long day. Surgery like this can take anywhere from 4 to 14 hours. Before we even go into the operating theatre, I already study on the tractography that Joseph, our PhD research person, has done. And I already have a mental image in my mind where those tracks align. Um, what we then do is we take that information and we marry it up to an MRI scan that we do during the surgery. This is the only paediatric hospital in Australia and one of the few in the world where they can do MRI scans in the operating theatre. That means that the neurosurgeons can see changes in the brain straight away. What it gives me as the surgeon is I can be very, very precise in where I am and where I need to be. And I can then operate and know exactly where the pathways are around that. And it means I can preserve function and that's the huge difference. Right now, Virginia is preparing to carefully open the left side of Oliver's brain. Just like dodgy wiring with bad insulation that causes short circuits, that scar tissue is the focus of his epileptic seizures. The challenge here today is to remove that scar tissue without damaging the nerve tracks that run right alongside it. Oliver's surgery has every promise of success and we'll be back to visit him in the next few months to see how he's getting on. For many epilepsy sufferers though, even the most revolutionary brain surgery is not an option. For those patients for whom surgery is not appropriate, a more experimental treatment called neurobionics is taking shape at St Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne. Surgery is suitable for some people, but nowhere near as many as we thought, either because the abnormalities that are causing the seizures are too big or in areas that are too hard for us to get to safely. So that's been a big problem. So neurobionics is linking brains and nerves to machines, essentially. One person who received a neurobionic implant was Hannah Galvin. It started off when I was 16. I'd had a big day at dancing and I ended up on the ground and then I woke up in hospital and asked my dad what epilepsy was. And we wondered whether we could treat Hannah better with medications and we tried a lot of other medications and unfortunately we didn't make much progress because she had terrible side effects from the tablets I'd have to say and so she seemed a really good candidate for the seizure prediction system. Developed by Mark Cook and his team, the seizure prediction system consists of an implant under the skin that actually tracks and alerts the user when they're about to have an epileptic seizure. 
So these are the electrodes that we put inside the brain and these were inserted directly over the surface of the brain recording the seizure activity and this long wire is tunnelled down under the skin just below the collarbone and then the actual device which records and transmits the information is implanted under the skin here too much like a heart pacemaker. Placed within the brain the electrode picks up electrical activity and sends it to the implant which in turn sends it wirelessly to a receiver that lets the user know that a seizure is imminent. A series of lights across the top tells the patient there's either high or moderate or a very low risk of seizures. In most patients, the seizure prediction system was a complete success, but not for Hannah. The surprise in the red light was, wow, I seizure quite a bit. I wasn't aware of the amount of seizures I had. I thought the, it, ju it just wasn't working properly. While Hannah's implant never stopped predicting seizures, she was simply having too many for the device to be effective. What if an implant could trigger a device to release drugs directly to where you need that medication? Well, that would be perfect. It's just not available yet. <laughs> Not quite yet, but Mark Cook and his team are already moving to the next phase of their neurobionic research. Mark, how similar is epilepsy in rats to epilepsy in humans? Different types of epilepsy in rats, but some rats have epilepsy which is identical to that in humans. In these particular rats, they have seizures, which are just like human seizures, but during that time we can test our new treatments on them. The treatment being tested here is the targeted delivery of anti-convulsant medication directly into the rat's brains via tiny pieces of drug-infused polymer. But they're very small particles, so this is some of the polymer at the bottom of this tube here, so uh, they're just like dust or very small plastic sheets that contain the drug at the moment. Because we know exactly where their seizures are from, we can a little deposit of a polymer that slowly releases an anticonvulsant drug in there. And recently we've demonstrated that we can use this to stop their seizures. So this is really exciting. Because the application is so targeted, it promises to increase the effectiveness and reduce the side effects of taking epilepsy medications. So what we're hoping to do ultimately is connect these sorts of bionic systems so that the device which is detecting or even predicting events is connected to a polymer like this, releasing very small amounts of drug directly to the brain only when it's needed. It's nearly two months since the operation and Oliver's back at home with his family. The combination of the surgery guided by the tractography has meant a dramatic transformation in his life. But watch where you're going. It's been about seven weeks since Elise's surgery. The night of the surgery, Ollie gave us kisses and said single words to us. He was still very groggy. And by about two days after the surgery, he was just bright and sparky. There's been a big physical recovery but it's been pretty obvious to us that there's no seizure activity and that the concentration and the clarity that we did the surgery for, that it's here already. It'll be two years from the surgery before we can be sure whether he's completely cured, but so far so good and we're really, really happy with how he's going so far. And what did Dr Virginia do? Put my seizures in the bin. They put your seizures where? In the bin. <laughs> Inside Oliver's brain, and the brains of hundreds of other recipients of tractography-guided surgery, the stool has quietened. This young boy's future, just like the future of epilepsy treatment, is looking promising indeed. <laughs>